Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bed crimers. As always, I wish you the best. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching this video, if you learned something or enjoyed it, please do me a favor and smash that like button. Now let's dig in. Wanting to fully understand what exactly is going on in the case of the Idaho Four and Brian Koberger, I spent some more time gathering answers to the questions I think most of us have about the grand jury's indictment of Koberger. Before I get into that, let me just say that Brian Koberger will be arraigned on Monday morning at 9 a.m. He will no doubt plead not guilty. After that, there's a hearing on May 22nd for the more than 25 news organizations who are fighting to have the gag order vacated or lifted. The lead lawyer representing those news outlets filed a motion asking that the court agree to hear arguments sooner or to issue a stay that would lift the gag order until arguments could be heard from all the parties, and Koberger's defense team responded to the news outlet's motion with an objection. They're asking that the hearing be further delayed so that Koberger can build his own case against the media coverage. Koberger objects, and I quote, on the grounds that the media's motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order raises factual issues that Mr. Koberger requires additional time to prepare because the media coverage of this case has been intense and because Mr. Koberger plans on providing expert testimony on its damaging effects, Mr. Koberger will require additional time and will not be prepared for such hearing on May 22nd, 2023, end quote. For some reason, I find the wording of that irritating. It makes it sound like Koberger is in his jail cell, acting as his own attorney and calling all the shots because he's so intelligent. Is anyone else irritated by that? I'm picturing him trying to get his hands on law books to cite statistics. I know he's innocent until proven guilty, but I guess seeing how he made that female police officer answer myriad questions when she pulled him over gives me a taste of what his classmates at WSU said about him being sort of heavy-handed with how he explained things in class. I wonder if this case for him now is like an interesting academic game. Could he be enjoying all this hullabaloo about himself, all the notoriety. I'm getting the feeling that that's what's happening. The Gonsalves family has also asked the lower court judge to lift the gag order, and their hearing on that will take place on May 25th. To the indictment information now. The first thing we have to understand, oh God, now I sound like the pedantic, heavy-handed one yikes, is that Brian Koberger was originally charged by complaint. A complaint is simply a statement of the essential facts of the offense or offenses to be charged. The purpose of the complaint is to establish probable cause, which then allows an arrest warrant to be issued. If probable cause is established, law enforcement initiates a criminal complaint and informs the defendant of the charges against him or her, and they arrest him or her. And that's exactly what happened to Brian Koberger on December 30th of 2022 at his family's home in Pennsylvania during that early morning raid. The next step in the process of getting a felony case prosecuted is obtaining an indictment. For felony cases, an indictment must be obtained, and the indictment can happen either through a preliminary hearing or a grand jury. The goal of both a preliminary hearing and a grand jury is the same, and that is to determine if there's sufficient evidence 
to bind the defendant, in this case Brian Koberger, over to stand trial, meaning they can hold him and move him forward in the process to a trial. It's up to the district attorney to initiate either a preliminary hearing or a grand jury. So in this case, the district attorney decided that a grand jury was most appropriate in the end, even though a preliminary hearing had already been scheduled for the week of June 26. That preliminary hearing has now been canceled because it's no longer needed. The grand jury handled all that business and decided it's appropriate to indict Brian Koberger. Prosecutors apparently often prefer grand juries because grand jury proceedings are supposed to take place in secret. But Koberger's defense team knew that when they waived his right to a speedy trial, that from the point of arrest until the preliminary hearing, at any moment, a grand jury could convene. So it's likely that they were anticipating a grand jury. So it's kind of like they have to prepare for that, but they also know that a grand jury could take place, which would cancel the preliminary hearing. But again, the main thing to understand is that during a grand jury, it's only the prosecution. The defense team is not there. But the defense doesn't know exactly when the grand jury would convene. So when the news broke, that's probably when they learned about it. When a grand jury convenes, the only people who are allowed to know about it and participate in it are, one, the prosecutors, meaning the state attorneys, two, the members of the grand jury, the jurors, three, the prosecution's testifying witnesses, four, an interpreter if one is needed, and five, a court reporter. So not even a judge can be present for the grand jury. By the way, a grand jury consists of from 16 to 23 citizens, and those same citizens serve for a period of up to 18 months on this grand jury. They are selected at random from a list of prospective jurors from which trial jurors are also selected. And it's up to the grand jury, meaning those 16 to 23 citizens, to decide if the prosecution has shown that there is sufficient evidence and probable cause to indict the defendant. If the grand jury says, yes, there's sufficient evidence, probable cause, then the indictment is issued, the defendant is notified, and a trial is scheduled. Having a grand jury provides the prosecution with several benefits. One, it allows their witnesses to testify more freely and truthfully. They aren't going to be cross-examined by the defense attorneys because, well, the defense isn't there. So it's just the prosecution asking their own witnesses questions. Two, it also allows the prosecution to control information. The prosecution doesn't want the defense poking holes in its case at this point. It wants to get approval to move forward to a trial. But of course, the defense has a legal right to hear what went down during the grand jury proceedings. They have a right to see a transcript of the whole thing and to hear the audio and the prosecution has to, by law, share all that with them. And by the way, if the prosecution knows of exculpatory evidence, meaning evidence that could show that Brian Koberger did not commit the crimes, they have an obligation to share that exculpatory evidence with the grand jury. But how the prosecution presents that exculpatory evidence to the grand jury isn't going to be the same as the way the defense would have shared it. The defense would push it hard, whereas the prosecution might try to minimize it. But no matter what, they have to share it with the grand jury. So this grand jury heard if there was any exculpatory evidence, but however that evidence was presented, it didn't stop them from indicting Brian Koberger. And they did that not based on them thinking that 
or declaring that Brian Koberger is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All the grand jury needed to decide was, did a crime occur? And is Brian Koberger probably the person who committed it? By the way, preliminary hearings apparently are cheaper and less time-consuming than grand juries because they don't have to pick a jury. It's the judge who's going to decide if there's probable cause to indict. By the way, if a witness testifies at the grand jury, that person's name can be made public. But apparently in this case, the new documents that were filed by the state asked for the names of the witnesses who testified at the grand jury to be sealed. And one of the reasons for that that they provided in the filing was that certain people had been harassed. And I think they might be talking about maybe Dylan Mortensen, maybe Bethany Funk. They want to keep people from knowing who testified so that these people are not attacked or contacted or harassed or threatened. And most of those threats, I guess, were coming from social media, according to the prosecutors. And by the way, seeing this tells us how the trial is probably going to be treated. They're going to try to keep everything on lockdown because they don't want these witnesses being harassed, intimidated, threatened, any of that stuff. So the judge granted this order and the names of the witnesses are sealed. And the judge who signed it is a district court judge. So the district court is now taking over the case. And what's interesting about that is this district court judge can now amend the gag order. He can decide if he wants to keep it in place. One more thing, after Brian Koberger pleads not guilty, I'm pretty sure he's going to plead not guilty, the state then has 60 days to decide if they're going to seek the death penalty. They have to let the defense team know at that point if they're going to do that. So thanks to this grand jury, we know that Brian Koberger will stand trial for the charges. Note that the trial date has not yet been set, but I heard that it probably will not take place until 2024 and possibly even 2025. And that's such a bummer to hear. It seems like the road to justice is very long. And this case, as we know, is quite complicated. First, there's so much evidence more than 20,000 pieces that we know of. It's gonna require a lot of experts on both sides. They're gonna have to analyze that evidence. They're gonna have to look at that DNA evidence. So I guess it's understandable that they're gonna need ample time to prepare for the trial. Again, the you know just being circumstantial, it complicates the whole thing. And Remember, the prosecution does not need to provide a motive, but you know they will because jurors will want to know what the motive was. We've all been speculating as to what could have driven him, if he is the guilty party, to do this to these four precious souls. But until the trial takes place and the prosecution lays their case out, we're not really going to know what story the evidence told them. The Lori Vallow case, the prosecutor said that Lori Vallow was driven to commit the crimes by money, power, and sex. And then they proceeded to tell the story in chronological order. And by the end of the trial, most people, including the jurors, could see exactly how that motive played out and how it led to all these deaths. By the way, from what I'm hearing, the trial will likely not be televised. The gag order that's currently in place to keep all the information and evidence under lock and key is an indicator that the trial, too, will likely not be televised. So it may turn out to be like the Lori Vallow trial, where we had to rely on transcripts and recordings after the day's end each day. It's very important that Brian Koberger get a fair trial. 
and both the prosecution and the defense are determined to see to it that he gets that. The prosecutors want a solid conviction. They think he's their man, and they don't want any post-conviction appeals. So they're going to want to do everything by the book. They don't want to make any mistakes. The defense has an obligation to ensure that Koberger gets a fair trial. So in essence, both sides are fighting for the same thing in that respect. I hope all of this helped. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories, do me a favor, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment, watch all the videos, it really helps. See you next time.